بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اخوتي والاخوات we are in سوره لقمان in verse number 14 onwards in surah luqman surah number 31 verse number 14 and onwards when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about the wisdom of luqman and what luqman alayhi salatu salam said to his son al insana biwalidayh and we encouraged mankind the scholars of islam said wasiya is of two types the first type of wasiya is the wasiya which is obligatory and the second type of wasiya is the wasiya which is not obligatory the wasiya which is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from his prophet sallallahu on the general rule a wasiya which is a obligation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a recommendation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a wasiya from allah Zawajal, is generally of the first type which is obligatory except if there are specific evidences that point to it not being obligatory. al insana over here this is the obligatory wasiya. al insana biwalidayh with his father and his mother hamalatu ummuhu wahdan ala wahd. His mother carried him difficulty upon difficulty and we explained that yesterday to mean wahdan ala wahd means upon difficulty and stress upon difficulty and stress. The first part of difficulty and stress the ulama mentioned, the first wahan means the pregnancy, the second wahan means the delivery. Meaning his breastfeeding is for two years. And we said that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed in the Quran, that the breastfeeding of the child be for two years minimum. That you should do shukr to me and to your parents. And Allah Zawajal mentioned this both in the same sentence that you should do shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to your parents and to me is your return. And shukr as we mentioned before, shukr is three things. Shukr is first to say thank you. Secondly, after you say thank you, the second thing you should do is actually mention that person's blessings to others. And the third thing is after you mention the blessings of your parents to others, the third thing you should do is do something back for them that is bigger or as much as you can, even if it is not to the same level, but as much as you can to the extent that they have done for you and beyond that, bi'idhillah. This is shukr. And we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shakur, a shakir. We mentioned that yesterday. Let's carry on today for the rest of Surah Luqman where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa in jahadaka. Now Allah subhanahu says that though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that you be good to parents, if the parents do the opposite of what they're meant to do. Meaning, instead of being good to you, they actually are bad to you. Or, the worst or bad that a parent can ever be to the child is what? Is actually order the child to worship any other gods other than Allah Zawajal, which is to order them to do shirk. And if they order you to do that which they have no knowledge of and that which you have knowledge of, which is to commit shirk with me and to associate partners with me, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Then do not obey them. Meaning that you cannot let your love for your parents overcome the love of Allah. And the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is anyone who lets the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be overcome by the love of anything else. Like for example, the love of your wife overcomes the love of Allah or the love of your children overcomes the love of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave you to them. Meaning if you love your work, for example, more than Allah, how do you love your work more than Allah? As an example, your work says, okay, you can work in this job, but you have to change your name. You can work, but you have to shave your beard. You can work, but you have to change. Uh, you can't pray Juma, for example. You have to be at work during Juma. So if you let your love for anything else overcome the love for Allah Zawajal, then Allah will leave you to the love that you have chosen other than Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave you to that love and so as a result, you will be punished by that thing that you love. The sunnah of Allah Zawajal is that anyone who loves anything more than Allah, that thing will punish that person. And that's true. Our children today that we love more than our, our God sometimes, 
more than Allah sometimes ends up being an adab for us. If we love our wives more than we love Allah then one day a day will come when our wives will become an adab for us. If we love this dunya more than the love of Allah then this dunya will become an adab for us. So if we love our parents more than we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then know this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love is far more stronger than the love of your parents. So you cannot therefore obey your parents over that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know that today, our parents, may Allah have mercy upon them, sometimes they tell us to not follow Islam out of, not out of uh, anything except experience, or not out of anything except that they have experienced that anyone who follows Islam has a beard, for example, is discriminated. So they might tell you, son, don't pray too much. Daughter, don't wear the hijab now. You can do it later. Son, don't wear a beard now. You can do it later. They say it not out of dislike of Islam, but out of fear that the children will get discriminated or get hurt. So in these cases, we do not call our parents enemies of Allah, but rather we try to convince them and we be kind and merciful and patient with them. However, in any case, in under no case at all, must we ever obey them over the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no obedience to creation over the obedience of Allah. Wa in jahadaka. An amazing thing, by the way. Look at the verse. The first says, Wa jahadaka. If they do jihad against you, meaning if they force you, fight you, force you to disobey Allah, then do not obey them. But Allah doesn't allow you to fight them back. What does Allah say? Fala tutihuma. Don't obey them. And be with them in this dunya in goodness and kindness. Meaning that even if they fight you, even then you cannot fight them back. Even if they were disbelievers, even if they were enemies of God. Meaning who does jihad against you in order to make you worship other gods other than Allah? It's a disbeliever, isn't it? So even if they therefore have become disbelievers by ordering you to worship other than Allah, even then you cannot be bad mannered to them. Meaning their ihsan, their goodness over you, even if they were enemies of God, is so much so that you cannot be bad to them. So my brothers and sisters Islam, this is an important advice for us. How today are we with our parents? How do we behave with them when they order us to do something we dislike? Not from the disobedience of Allah, but something we dislike. We sometimes treat them worse than we do even enemies of God. So we must be of those people who are the most kind and gentle and soft with our parents, even if they are disbelievers, even if they are enemies of God. Because indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us over here that if they do jihad against you in order to make you worship other gods other than Allah, Allah has not all allowed us to be bad to them. He said, huma fid dunya ma'rufa, And be with them in this dunya ma'rufa. The scholar said, what does ma'roof mean? Ma'roof means whatever is, whatever is normal, and general amongst the community. So, for example, what is the general uh, behavior in Malaysia with parents? What is the general behavior? Do we, for example, answer our parents when they call us? Do we, for example, look after them when they get old? Do we, for example, uh, pay for them when they don't have money? If the answer is yes, then this is the way we should be with our parents all the time. Ma'rufa meaning that which is best, that which is generally accepted to be the most appropriate behavior. And follow the path of those who do, those who turn to me. Anaba means two things. Anaba means the one who turns to me, two things. Number one, he repents. And number two, he glorifies Allah. So Anaba means the one who repents to Allah and the one who glorifies Allah at the same time whilst thinking that he is a very poor person and bankrupt. So if you think that you're bankrupt, have no deeds in front of Allah, and you repent to Allah, then you have done anaba to Allah, right? What tabi' meaning follow the sabil, the path of those who repented to me. Thumma ilayya marji'ukum faunabbi'ukum bima kuntum ta'amaloon. Thumma thereafter ilayya to me, marji'ukum is your return. Faunabbi'ukum, then I will tell you, Bima kuntum with what you used to ta'maloon with what you used to do in this dunya. Tayyib ikhwati. Moving on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bunaya quotes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Luqman al-Hakim saying, 
what an amazing statement. He says, Ya Bunaya, if I said to my son, Ya Bani, Ya Ibni, or Ya Bani, Ya Bani means, oh my sons. Ya Ibni means my son. Bunaya, on the other hand, means my beloved, beautiful son. Okay? Like, uh, abati, ya abati, like my father. We, I can say abi, meaning my father, but ya abati means my beloved, beloved, uh, gentle father. Ya bunayya means my beloved, loving son. So it's a way of showing that when you give advice to somebody, open up the word of advice with a word of love. Perhaps that the, it might make it easy for the person accepting the advice to accept the advice. So Allah says, Ya bunayya. Allah quotes Luqman al-Hakim saying to his son, Luqman said, Ya Bunayya, O my son, Innaha intaku mithqal habbatin min khardarin. Innaha, verily if there is, intaku if there was, mithqal, like the example of a atom's weight, or mithqal means a very tiny seed, mithqal habbatin, so a very tiny seed, min khardalin from mustard grain. So have you seen the mustard seed is very, very tiny. So it's a very tiny seed. And the Quran mentions min by way of saying the tiniest of things. Right? فَتَكُونَ فِي صَخْرَ So this little grain, this small one atom's weight of tiny thing, it's actually inside a whole mountain. It's inside a brick. It's inside a wall. It's inside a big rock. فَتَكُونُ فِي صَخْرَ أَوْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ Or in the heavens. أَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Or in the earth. يَأْتِي بِهَا اللَّهِ Allah knows where it is. Allah will bring it out. So after Luqman tells his son to not commit shirk with Allah, then tells him to be good to his parents, what is the third thing Luqman told his son to be? Is to inculcate in his heart taqwa fear of Allah because if Allah can bring out even an atom's weight of good or bad inside a big rock or in the heavens or in the earth that means you cannot do a single deed that can ever be hidden from Allah Allah will bring it out on the day of judgment it is for this reason my brothers and sisters Islam inculcate this habit of taqwa in children whatever age they are Inculcate this fear of Allah Zawajal, that whatever you do, no one can know this except Allah. And if Allah knows about it, He will bring it out on the day of judgment. So make sure what you do is good. Inculcate this habit of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hearts. Ya Bunayya, innaha intaku mithqala habbatin min khardalin, fatakuna fi sakhratin, aw fi samawati, aw fi al-ard, yati biha Allah, Allah will bring it out. Inna Allaha latifun khabir. Verily Allah is latif, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely aware of every single secret. Latif is the one who is aware of secrets. The one who is aware of every single thing that is hidden. The one who is aware of every single thing that no one else is aware of. Latifun khabir. Khabir meaning aware of all things. Always the one who has news about everything. So you know when we say to someone who always tells us about others, we say, MashaAllah, anta khabir. MashaAllah, you are an expert. You know so much about something. That's what you call khabir. So if Allah is al-khabir, that means He is aware of every single thing. If He's latif, meaning nothing is hidden from Him, He is completely aware of everything, nothing is secret from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters Islam, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he said, the goodness, the summary or the summation of all goodness is in the fear of Allah. All good can be summarized in fearing Allah All good, whatever good you can think of. If we can inculcate this habit of fearing Allah, then, then all of good will be summarized in it. Alhamdulillah. What does fear of Allah really mean? What does it mean to fear Allah? Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, he said, fear of Allah is like you walking on a road. And on that road is a couple of thorns that are pointing out from the front, from the back, 
from under, underneath you. So what you do is when you're walking on the road, you're always afraid to make sure that you bend your body so that you do not get hurt by the thorns of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are these thorns? These thorns are the limits of Allah, hudud of Allah, the haram which Allah has made haram. So as a result, taqwa is to walk on this road always being wary of avoiding the haram of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars of Islam, they said taqwa is to do every single thing which Allah has commanded and to be away from every single thing which Allah has forbidden, whether it is apparent or it is hidden, whether it is apparent or it is hidden, whether it is in the acts of ibadah or it is in the acts of interaction between human beings. Taqwa is to avoid everything which is forbidden and to do everything which is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Bunayya, the second thing the, the, or the fourth thing after he spoke about shirk, then number two being goodness to parents, number three being number three being taqwa, what's the next thing he tells his son? The next thing he tells his son, Ya Bunayya aqim as salah Oh my son, establish the prayer. So after taqwa comes salah, or the necessary condition of having taqwa in the heart is that Luqman told his son, you must establish the salah. So Ya Bunayya aqim as salah establish the prayer. Wa'mur bil ma'roof, after establishing the prayer, what's the fifth thing that he tells his son to do? The fifth thing he tells his son, Wa'mur bil ma'roof, command the good. Wanha anil munkar, and forbid people from that which is wrong. Wasbir ala ma asabak. Number six being, or number seven being, Wasbir ala ma asabak, and be patient with that which befalls you. This is a very important verse. Very important verse. Because after taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Luqman al Hakim told him the most important way of preserving taqwa of Allah is salah. Because you see, salah is a light from Allah. Zawajal. And it is a mukaffira from dhunub. It is something that stops us from sinning. And it is something that helps us to forgive the sins that we have incurred in this dunya. Salah is the greatest link that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is like a river that is in front of our homes that we have a shower in it every time, every day, five times a day. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said. In the authentic hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in Musnad Imam Ahmed, that when someone prays, the angels put their sins on their shoulders and on their head. And when they do ruku, then some of the sins fall off. And when they do sujood, all the sins fall off. This is what salah is. Salah is a cleanser of our sins. It is a means of reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is our ability to come close to Allah in our ruku. Salah itself is dua. Salah itself is dua. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu said, as salah huwa dua Salah itself is dua. So through salah, we are actually supplicating to Allah throughout, with our body, with our deeds, with our mind. So this is, Ya Bunayya aqim as salah And remember, he didn't say pray, meaning salli, pray. Rather he said, aqim as salah meaning establish the prayer. And remember yesterday we discussed this topic of establishing prayer. And we said establishing prayer, does not simply mean to pray. It means to order others to pray as well. It means to build masjids. It means to appoint, appoint imams. It means ensure that the adhan is given. Make sure the iqama is given. Make sure people teach others about how to pray. Make sure books are printed about salah. Make sure the shops are closed. When salah happens, when the adhan happens, all of this is part of iqamat al-salah. Wa aqim salah he said, Therefore, when he told his son to do iqamat al-salah, that means his son cannot do, do iqamat al-salah until his son also tells his other children, his other siblings also, that, oh, my brother, oh, my sister, also you should pray. This is called iqamat al-salah. Aqim al-salah, wa'mur bil ma'roof, and command the good, wanhaan al-munkar, and forbid against the evil. Ya khuti, this is something which is missing in our community today. In our community, we do not command the good, we do not forbid the evil. We tell people when someone comes and tells you, Akhi, don't smoke. What do we tell them? Lakum deenukum wal yadeen. 
But Ikhwati, Lakum Deenukum Wal Yadeen was not revealed for Muslimin. Lakum Deenukum Wal Yadeen was revealed for Kuffar who rejected the Hidayah and they didn't want to listen at all. Finally, Allah tells them, Lakum Deenukum Wal Yadeen. But for Muslimin, this verse doesn't apply. For Muslimin, your deen is my deen. My deen is your deen. Right? For Muslimin, you have to tell them what is right and you have to tell them to stay away from what is wrong. Lakum deenukum does not apply to Muslimin. So for every single Muslim, you have to say, Akhi, by the way, smoking is not something which is, which is Islamic. By the way, angels stay away from you. Do you know if you smoke, angels don't come to your house? Because angels are harmed by that which human beings are harmed. Brothers, don't do this. Stay away from women. Stay away from speaking to women that are not halal for you. That are not mahram to you. Be wary of you know, dating others, dating girlfriends or boyfriends, right? Because this will lead you to haram. So what Amr bil ma'roof nahi al munkar is something which is missing in our community. And ikhwati, in the Quran, the Jews, the Jews or those who, the early Yahud were cursed in the Quran upon the tongue of Isa ibn Maryam and the prophets of God. I want to tell you this verse in the Quran. Listen to what Allah says. لُعِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِن بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُودَ وَعِيسَ ابْنَ مَرْيَمْ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَعْتَدُونَ كَانُوا لَا يَتَنَاهَوْنَ عَنْ مُنْكَرٍ فَعْلُوهُ لَبِئْسَ مَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ What an amazing verse. Allah says, those who were disbelievers from the children of Israel were cursed by Dawood and by Isa ibn Maryam Two of the prophets cursed those who disbelieved from Banu Israel. Why? That's because some of the Banu Israel used to transgress the limits. They used to do sins, transgress the limits. But the rest of Banu Israel, why were they cursed? Because of this verse. What did they say? Allah continues and says, the rest of the people who used to see these other guys sinning, they never used to tell them, don't do it. They never used to tell the ones who were sinning, don't do that sin. What an evil thing they used to do. What was the evil? The evil was that they used to never ever tell the others to not do the sins. This was evil enough. This was evil in the eyes of Allah. So ikhwati, if today we see people doing sins and we do not go out and tell them, please brothers and sisters, avoid doing this wrong, avoid doing this, this mistake or do this guys. This is Ramadan, time for fasting, time to close the shops down, time to come for ibadah, time to read the Quran. Akhi, would you like to come with me for, uh, for taraweeh? Or telling the non-Muslims, for example, about Islam. If we do not do this, then we're not commanding the good, forbidding the evil, ikhwati. And if we don't do this, then Allah will punish us. In the authentic hadith, which is in Sahih Muslim, it is reported that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam to a town to destroy the town. So Jibreel went to destroy the town. Before he destroyed the town, he came back to Allah again. He said, Ya Rabb, but there is a righteous person in that town. He said, there is a righteous person in that town. So Allah said, Begin with him. Means destroy the town by destroying him first. Why? And Nawawi rahimahullah said in the explanation, Nawawi, the great scholar of the Shafi Madhab, in the explanation of this hadith, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Jibreel to begin with him because this man never used to command the good, forbid the evil. He never used to tell the other people to not do what they're doing. On the other hand, did Allah save, did Allah save uh, Prophet, uh, uh, subhanallah, uh, Nuh alayhi salatu salam? Didn't Allah save Nuh? Why did Allah save Nuh? Allah saved Nuh because he was Amr bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar. He was the one who commanded the good, forbade the evil. Why did Allah get angry with Yunus alayhi salatu salam? Why did Allah almost punish Yunus by allowing him to be eaten by the whale because he left commanding the good, forbidding the evil. Right? And this is why, Ikhwani, if we stop commanding the good, forbidding the evil, Allah will destroy us. 
If I stop teaching people the knowledge I know, that Allah will destroy me first. And this is why, Ikhwani, if you know something about Islam, remember what Rasulullah said, Balligu anni walaw ayah. Spread for me even if it be one ayah. So we must be of those who command the good, forbid the evil every day. Every day we must command the good, forbid the evil. And how can we command the good, forbid the evil if we don't have an Islamic knowledge? So therefore, part of commanding the good, forbidding the evil is that you should also learn Islamic knowledge. And by the way, sometimes we think that commanding the good, forbidding the evil takes you away from ibadah. Yes, it might take you away from ibadah, but never ever think commanding the good, forbidding the evil is less than the ibadah. I remember one amazing story, which I want to tell you all, is that you know in Makkah, how there's so much people there, right? So much people. And some of them, they wear the bisht, like the sheikh, sheikh clothing. And they tell the people, men this way, women this way. And they clear the paths. Have you seen those guys in Makkah? When you go for tawaf, they say men this way, women this way. So some of them were very sad. They came to a scholar by the name of Abdullah Jibreen. He passed away, rahimahullah, great scholar in Saudi Arabia. They came to him and said, yeah, sheikh, we're very sorry. We're very sad today. Why are you sad? Because today is the 20th. Today is the 26th night. Today is, tomorrow is going to be the 27th night. We're very sad because we spend our time telling people to go right and left and we can't even pray ourselves. We can't pray ourselves because we're busy telling people to do what's right and wrong. So we're feeling very sad ourselves and we're missing the night. We're missing the salah. So we feel very sorry. So at that point, Sheikh said, okay, tomorrow, come tomorrow, with, tomorrow to me. I'll, I'll give you the answer tomorrow. So they went to Sheikh Jibreel tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, the next day. And guess what? It was reported that Sheikh Abdullah bin Jibreel left his salah and went with them, doing the same thing. He turned this way, men this way, women that way. Meaning he joined them that night just to show them that what you are doing is not lesser in the eyes of Allah. Never ever think commanding the good, forbidding the evil is lesser in the eyes of Allah. It is greater in the eyes of Allah because not only are you helping yourself, you're helping your brother and sister learn about Islam and avoid that which is haram. So this is a good thing, my brothers and sisters in Islam. And if our children can have this izzah and honor to tell others to do good and avoid the bad, then we have nothing to worry about because they will also stay away from the bad. You see, children are very innocent. They will never ever tell others to stay away from something and do it themselves. No, they will also stay away from that thing. So if you teach them smoking is haram, drugs are bad, then they will also tell others and they will also stay away from it themselves. Alhamdulillah. This is the benefit of this statement of Luqman al-Hakim to his son. Ya bunayya aqim as-salah. Establish the prayer. Wa'mur bil ma'roof. Command the good. Wanhan al-munkar. And tell people to stay away from the munkar, evil. Wasbir ala ma asabak. Meaning when you command the good, forbid the evil, then people will not like you. Because no one likes anyone who tells you to do right or wrong. No, <laughs> people don't like those people sometimes. And so Allah says, Wasbir ala ma asabak. Be patient even if people reject you. Look at Rasulullah When he told people to do good, forbid the evil, they pelted him, they called him names. When he went to Ta'if in the 10th year of Hijrah to tell them to do good, forbid the evil, they pelted him with stones until blood came from his legs. So ikhwati wasbir ala ma asabak. Be patient with that which befalls you. Also, have you noticed in, in, in Surah Fatiha, what do we say? We say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, Iyyaka Na'budu wa Iyyaka Nasta'een. Why do we say right after Iyyaka Na'budu wa Iyyaka Nasta'een? Ihdina Sirat Al-Must... Iyyaka Na'budu, sorry. We say right after Iyyaka Na'budu, we say Iyyaka Nasta'een. Why? Have you thought about this? If you worship only Allah, the scholars of Islam said, the dunya will fight you. If you worship only Allah, shaitan will fight you. If you worship only Allah, the enemies of this dunya will not tolerate it. They will fight you. And that is for this reason why, the very next verse is only you we seek help from, O oh Allah. Because if we worship only you, we know that shaitan will not leave us alone. 
and shaitan will convince other people to not leave us alone. And as a result, only you we seek help. It is for this reason why when you do Amr bil ma'roof, nahi anil munkar, people will not leave you alone. And that is why, wasbir ala ma asabak. Be patient, my son, with that which befalls you. Wasbir ala ma asabak. Inna dhalika min azmi al umur. Look at this wise man. He tells his son, verily, patience is from the highest of affairs, the most difficult of things to have, but the most blessed and most highest of upright character that you should build within yourselves. So, sabr, my brothers and sisters, Islam. What is sabr? Sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. That's what the ulama say. What is sabr? Sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. So if you have, for example, poverty, you end up having bad thoughts about Allah. What is a bad thought? Oh, if I, if I don't have money, how am I going to pay my rent? Oh, how am I going to live? How am I going to feed my kids? Oh, I'm going to become disgraced. This is you having bad thoughts about Allah. But sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. No, Ya Rab, I know you're giving me poverty because you want my re reward to increase. Oh Allah, you're going to make me a stronger person. Allah, you're giving me difficulty in this dunya because you're going to increase my reward in the akhirah. Oh Allah, you're giving me difficulty now so that I can be stronger for more difficulty in the future. This is what sabr really is. Sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. Have good thoughts about Allah when Allah gives you disease. When Allah gives you blindness. Or Allah gives you cancer. Or Allah gives you some other disease that He has given you. Have sabr with it. Oh Allah, you're giving me this because you want to remove my sins. Because you want to make me stronger. Because you want me to appreciate your blessings and your ni'mah. Because you want to give me a greater ajr on the day of judgment. Have good thoughts about Allah. Ya akhwati, sabr is one of the most difficult things to have, but it is the most uh, rewarding thing to have. In fact, some of the scholars of Islam, such as Ibn Qayyim, they said, half of Iman is sabr. Half of Iman is to be patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because not every single thing in this dunya will go as you wish. If half of the time you will be in blessings, the other half you might be in test. So you must therefore have sabr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Wasbir ala ma asabak inna dhalika min azmi al-umur. Do you know, Yaqwati ibn al-Qayyim rahimallah, ibn Kathir and others, they said sabr is of three levels. There are three levels of sabr. The lowest level of sabr, the lowest level of sabr is sabr with the musibah that strikes you in this dunya. So your parents pass away, your children die, you lose your job, right? You have a car accident, well, ya'adhu billah, Allah save us from all of this. This is the lowest level of sabr. But subhanAllah, look at, look at today, we don't even have this level of sabr today, subhanAllah. I still remember how people behaved when the tsunami happened. You know the big tsunami that happened in 1995? I don't know if people remember. No, I'm sorry, in uh, 2005, I apologize. In 2005, the big tsunami where one million people died. I still remember even people, when I landed in, in, in England, I was going to London for a lecture tour. When I landed in London, I picked up the newspaper. I have the habit of picking up the newspaper from uh, Heathrow, buying the local newspaper. I still remember that the Archbishop of Canterbury, he's supposed to be a man of God. He said, the tsunami made me question Allah, made me question God. Subhanallah, wallahi, you know, even sometimes people who say they have faith, don't have faith. So you need to have sabr, my brothers in Islam, encourage every single person, everyone around you to be patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. Because no one truly understands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta ta thinks globally and we think locally. Every single thing that happens to us is good. Even if what happens to us is evil. Because in Islam, there is nothing called pure evil. There is nothing called pure evil. This thing that we say is pure evil. Like shaitan, even shaitan has a good side. Well, where does shaitan have a good side? Well, if shaitan didn't exist, 
then would any one of us make dua to Allah? Would any one of us have sabr? Would any one of us make istighfar? So we, we thank you, Shaitan. You made us open up a whole, a whole door of ibadah. Okay? If evil didn't exist, a whole world of ibadah, of sabr and istighfar and dua and fear of Allah would not be open to us. And how many times does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a better slave through shame about any of the sins that we have done rather than through good deeds? Ibn Qayyim says, how many sins take you to Jannah? Whereas how many good deeds might take you to Jahannam? Because sometimes when you do, do good, you become very, very proud of yourself. Wow, look at me now. I am Hajji, Hajji Shaykhul Islam Tawfiq Chaudhuri. <laughs> I mean, sometimes when you do a good deed, you end up having pride and the pride destroys you. But sometimes when you have a bad deed, an evil deed you have done, you feel ashamed in front of Allah. Your eyes are full of tears. You feel sorry. You're more careful in your next salah. And that is what Allah loves more than anything else. Correct? And so how many sins make you give you humility and how many good deeds give you pride? This is why Rasulullah said, Wallahi, every single son of Ibn Adam sins. And if you do not sin, Allah will replace you with people who will sin. Why? Because Allah humbles us through sinning. And that's why Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained that human beings sin so that Allah brings them down, humbles them, makes them lower, more humble and meek through their sinning. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they humble themselves in this dunya, Allah will raise them up in the akhirah. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, the lowest of sabr is sabr with the pay, with the musibah Allah has given you. The second level, level higher than this, is sabr, is sabr against doing haram. Sabr when a beautiful woman invites you. Or sabr when you don't have money and you want to deal in haram steal something or take a riba loan. Sabar, when you want to do something haram that you do not do it, this is the second level of sabar. But the highest level of sabar, the highest level of sabar is sabar in doing good deeds. Patience and persistence in doing good deeds is the highest level of sabar. How difficult is it to be patient in doing good deeds every single day? Wallahi, it is so difficult. It is so difficult to come to this class, for example, of tafsir every single day. It is so difficult to fast every single day, to pray taraweeh every single day, to give sadaqah every single day. Very hard. But this is the azmil umur. This is the greatest sign. Greatest sign in the eyes of Allah Azza Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is easy to take your wife on a holiday once in a while, let's go, honey, let's go for a holiday. Where are we going, honey? Let's go to Langkawi. Let's go to Langkawi for a beautiful holiday. You go to Langkawi, you put her on a beautiful five-star hotel, have a great time. It's very easy to do that. But as soon as you come back home after the big holiday with your wife that you love so much, then you're back to your work. You don't respect her anymore. You reject her. You don't spend time with her. This is not much of a love. But imagine you never took your wife to Langkawi for a holiday. Imagine you never did that. But what you did do is every day you bought your wife a rose. Every day, a rose, two ringgit, one ringgit. If you don't know where to buy a rose, come to me, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> so you buy your wife a rose every day, every day. I'm telling you, your wife, and I'm sure all the sisters are smiling. They all will agree that this is far more beloved to them than a trip to Langkawi. True? Absolutely. Why? Because the small things that are done is more difficult to do, to do it regularly every day. More difficult. And so, that is why my brothers and sisters in Islam, sabr, sabr, sabr is something Allah loves. Patience in doing good is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. The small deeds, and that's why Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said in an authentic author from himself, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves more than the big things that we do, the small deeds that are done regularly. The small deeds that are done regularly is more beloved to Allah Azzawajal than the big deeds that are done once in a while. This is more beloved to Allah Azzawajal. 
طيب واصبر على ما اصابك ان ذلك من عزم العمور ولا تصاعر خدك للناس <coughs> I thought I was going to finish Surah Luqman today but it's impossible so let me take the next two verses in it's just so full of wisdom Allah this surah is amazing inshallah tomorrow I'll finish Surah Luqman ولا تصاعر خدك للناس what does تصاعر خدك للناس meaning never ever turn your faces away from people meaning when people speak to you always look at them and give them attention wallahi this is such an amazing thing do you know what i'm a medical doctor in australia and in australia we have a habit of suing medical doctors <laughs> the australians okay they have a habit of suing medical doctors not all of them of course not as bad as america but doctors do get sued and you know one of the most important things they told us from my insurance company they told us how can we doctors not get sued by our patients they said the most important thing is that you listen to them. <laughs> that when you talk to them, you turn to them and you listen to them. So the insurance company, what they did was that they actually sent us a file to learn how to be a better communicator with our patients. How to sit. They taught us, for example, not to sit like this. You know, ah, Alan, come on, sit down. Yes, sir. What's wrong with you? Never ever speak to your patient like that. Always they said 30 degrees. So you sit with your chair like this, 30 degrees forward, with your hands on your legs like this, and then you speak to your patients like this. Meaning this shows that you're paying attention to the patient. Because one of the things the patients want to know is that you, th that you care for them. And the only way they know you care for them is that you listen to them. So ikhwati, if you want to have good relationship with people, listen to them. وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ nas. Meaning, do not turn your faces away from people when they're speaking to you. Nor turn your faces away from people when they're asking you for something. Look to them, speak to them, give them the full attention. And this is why one of the ways that I learned when I was learning how to give public lectures was to actually turn to people and speak. So if I was giving a khutbah, one of the lessons they teach you in public lectures is always face the people directly. So if I'm turning to the left, I shouldn't go like this and then like that. No, I should actually turn my body like this and then actually turn my body like that when I'm doing a public lecture. Okay. This is because I should give them full attention. And subhanAllah, this is what Luqman is telling his son. Meaning do not turn your faces away because they will think you're arrogant or that you don't care or that you that the person will think I am not important for you to even listen to me. So do not do not turn your faces away from people arrogantly. So my brothers and sisters Islam, when people speak to you, look at them, turn to them. Of course, if they are, uh, uh, you know, brothers, if they're brothers, sisters, if they're sisters, but turn to them, face them, give them attention and do not arrogantly turn their face away. In the authentic hadith, it is reported by Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu that no one used to speak to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until no one would finish. I mean the Prophet sallallahu would never ever turn his face away until the person speaking to the Prophet sallallahu had turned his face away. And the Prophet sallallahu would never ever withdraw his hand from shaking until the other person first withdrew their hand. Right guys, what a simple advice. But how much it will help you in your life subhanallah. How much will you raise up in people's life? How much empathy and sympathy? How much rapport will you, will you build with people, my brothers and sisters in Islam? This is the best advice Luqman gave his son. وَلَا تُسْعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا So instead of telling him, don't have pride, he's telling him, don't do those actions that show that you have pride. And this is a better way to teach children. A better way to teach children is, hey, don't be arrogant. Don't be angry. No, 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 no. I mean, children don't understand that. A better way to teach people is to tell them to avoid deeds that they do when they're angry or when they're arrogant. So one of the ways that people behave when they're arrogant is they walk this way. <laughs> Look at me, man. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I am so rich you are, and you are so poor. Yeah, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? The way you walk shows how you behave with mankind. 
So walk very humbly. In one authentic narration, it was reported that Rasulullah sallallahu saw Abu Dujana. You know Abu Dujana? Abu Dujana was one of the toughest Sahaba. Toughest Sahaba. And he used to wear a red turban. They used to call him the turban of death. Okay? <laughs> so Abu Dujana took the sword from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in the battle of Uhud. And he started walking around like this. Meaning, in a very boastful, proud manner. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah hates that type of walking except in jihad. Yeah, Allah hates that type of walking except in jihad. Meaning, Yehuti, we, we're not in jihad right now. So at this point in time, don't walk in a boastful manner where you are so proud and mighty. In the same way, if Allah is talking about walking, in the same way, don't drive your car in a proudful manner. Don't lead your life in a proudful manner. Don't speak in a proudful manner. Do not speak, do not behave in a manner which boasts and shows arrogance to others. The opposite also we should not do. What's the opposite? The opposite where you are humble and meek like this all the time. Oh, sorry, sorry. You know, I think, uh, did I just tell you that I used to be an actor before? No, no, just, just joking with you all. So it's true. Sometimes people behave like this, you know, with their shoulders hung down. Do you know what I'm talking about? Both of them are disliked in the Sharia. In one authentic narration, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, not, uh, not from Rasul it was from Umar. It was reported that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu saw a man with his shoulders crouched up like this, walking in a very humble manner. So Umar hit him in the back, doop. You know, thumped him in the back very hard. You know, like Umar, mashallah, you know, he went for the, he went for the bullseye straight away. So he thumped him in the back very hard. So the man got up like this. He said, if someone is the carrier of the Quran, let him walk in a noble manner. Right? Let him walk in a noble manner. Subhanallah. So ikhwati, a Muslim should not be over humble or over boastful and proud. Right? Wala tamshi fil ardi marha. Do not walk in this earth as if you are boastful. Wala tamshi fil ardi marha. Inna Allah, verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yuhibbu. He does not love. Kulla, every single mukhtalin fakhur, boastful, arrogant human being. Boastful, arrogant human being. Ya khuti, we have to watch out for this. Sometimes we become self-amazed. Do you know one of the musibahs that we have today is this musibah of self-amazement. Wow, look at me now. This self-amazement is musibah. It happens after you graduate from university. It happens after you get a big job. It happens after you make a lot of money. It happens after you buy a big car. It happens to people sometimes. Wow, look at me now, attitude. Ikhwati, always be humble. The most beautiful people are the rich people who are humble. Have you seen them? Someone so rich, so rich, but he is so humble and so gentle. Such is a person who is humble. And the more you grow in your wealth, the more humble you have to become. Otherwise, people will think you're arrogant. This is one of the lessons I've learned in my life. The more powerful you become in this dunya, the more wealth you have, the more name and fame you have, the more humble you must become. Otherwise, the opposite will become true is that you are considered arrogant in this dunya, mukhtal in fakhur, arrogant, boastful, prideful person. Taib, last verse for today. Meaning, it's amazing. This man, Luqman al-Hakim, is so wise that he does not tell his son about qualities of how to be, but tells him how to behave in a particular way. And one of the things I've learned as the running Mercy Mission, running a couple of thousand people around the world, is that subhanAllah, you can't modify how people think. But you, can, but you can ask them to think in a particular way by asking them to behave in a particular way. If you ask them to behave in a particular way, then you know what? Then their thinking changes. So if you don't allow your son to walk that way, all walk that way, then he'll neither become weak or humble. Let me give you an example. 
Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, he said, teach your children, listen to this hadith. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, he said, teach your children horse riding, swimming and archery. You know about this, right? Horse riding, swimming and archery. Can anyone tell me why? Actually, we don't have time, so let me tell you why. <laughs> well, he said archery. Why archery? Why? Because every Muslim has to become an archer? No, man. It's because when you learn archery, you learn focus. You learn to be composed. You learn that even a simple movement of your hand will have a big effect in where the arrow goes. So you learn focus. You learn skill. You learn sabr and patience. You become more careful with what you do. Right? And you become focused towards a goal. What about swimming? Swimming because you know that when you swim, you learn stress, how to behave in stress. When you swim, you know that the more stressed you get, the more you sink. The less stressed you are, the more comfortable you are, the more you float. So you, so you know therefore how to swim. So you learn how to behave in stressful situations. Why horse riding? Because if you can control a big horse, you can control human beings. Because if you are a small boy and you can ride a big horse, then I can tell you, you can lead mankind. True? Izza, honor teaches you leadership. And so this, these are things that are missing today, Ikhwati. If we, instead of telling people, become leaders, don't be stressed, learn focus. People, <laughs> I mean, people are going to say, okay, I, so tell me, how do I become focused? How do I learn leadership? How can I be less stressed? Instead of doing that, tell people to do things that will help them become more focused, learn leadership and be less stressed. Okay? So, final verse, he says, Waqsud fi mashik. Meaning, do not take big gates in your walk, nor take small gates in your walk. Walk in a most gentle manner. How did Rasulullah walk? The Prophet used to take strides, small strides, not big ones, small ones, but he used to walk very, very fast. He used to walk very fast until they used to say that the Sahaba used to have to run next to him in order to ask him a question. So waqsud fi mashik, meaning watch how you walk because the way you walk will have an effect on yourself. If you walk casually, okay, very casual walker, that means your life is also like that. Are, akhi, come on man, hurry up and walk faster. Faster man, move yourself. The way you walk, how much of our life is actually walking? In a typical human being, it was reported that, uh, that approximately in the Western lifestyle, approximately 5,000 steps every day. If you only took 10,000 steps, that would be very good for your heart. But approximately in a normal human being's life in the West now, it's about 5,000 steps. In the rural areas, approximately 15,000 steps. So a lot of our life is actually walking. <laughs> so if it is for walking, then watch how you walk. It will set the pattern for the rest of your life. Walk sudfi mashik. And watch how you walk. Waghdud min sawtik. Oh, this one. This one is amazing. Waghdud min sawtik. And watch the tone of your voice. And watch the volume of your voice. Ya Yusuf. Ya Yusuf, wainak. I think, how am I speaking? Do I sound like a pleasant human being? Do I sound like a very arrogant father? Do I sound like a controlling son? Who, what do I sound like? Controlling husband? True or not? Yeah, Yusuf. Yusuf, where are you? I mean, how do I sound like now? I sound like a baby, like a weakling, like a henpecked husband. Okay? Yeah, Yusuf, where are you? Come on, Baba. How do I sound like now? better human being. So can you see the tone of the voice? In fact, you know, they say that when you lecture, you want to be a lecturer and you want to give public speeches. The most important coach that you need is called a voice coach. Voice coach, how you raise your voice up high and you lower your voice up low. How you add emphasis to your voices and how you remove emphasis from your voice. How you say Allah will give us adab. And he will also give us Jannah. So the way you modulate your voice is the biggest impact in the way people understand the words. And the biggest impact in the emotion is through the modulation of the voice. Ya ikhwati, 
all of this depends on how you raise your voice. This is why the greatest advice of this man was waqsud fi mashik waqdud min sawtik and watch the tone of your voice. Inna ankar al-aswati la sawtul hamid. The worst of voices or sounds is the brain of the donkey. What is wrong with the donkey? The scholars of Islam said the donkey brays at the wrong time. It brays with a high pitch and it brays with a high tone. So watch your pitch, watch your tone, watch the volume of your speech and people will end up thinking highly of you. Can you imagine how wise is this man? So my brothers and sisters Islam, this is the story of Luqman Al-Hakim, the wise man from Africa who lived in Yemen. The man who was not a prophet of God was an average human being, but inshallah he is from the Muslimin in Jannah because Allah quotes him the advice that he gave to his son, advising him to do the most important things before the lesser important things. So this is the advice that I have for you. And I hope that inshallah ta'ala this was beneficial to you. The story of Luqman inshallah tomorrow with Allah's will we will finish the surah tafsir of surah Luqman inshallah. Please tell one and all, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.